Hey guys, in the last video we talked briefly about what is a subspace and we talked about the subspace test and like how those properties work, like what does it look like geometrically, but we didn't actually do any like applications of the subspace test with like computations that you're likely to see in a course like for linear algebra. So this video is going to be um, assuming you already have a baseline knowledge of what the subspace test is and actually applying this test to a couple different examples. Uh, so let's get right into it. So we have this set Q, and we're asked to determine if uh, if this set is a, uh, a subspace of its respective vector space, which in this case is R2. So Q, it's defined as a single vector with uh, components x, y uh, in R2, but x has to be equal to y squared. So the first thing that I always do is check if the zero vector is in the set. If the zero vector is not in Q, you can immediately say this is not a subspace, or Q is not a subspace of R2 in this case. And it's a really easy one to check. So let's do, um, let's consider, consider zero, zero, the zero vector in R2. And you'll notice that the X component is zero and the Y component is zero. So you can clearly see uh, 0 squared is equal to 0, right? We get 0 equals 0. So you can tell that the 0 vector is in Q. So the first condition of our subspace test is met. So we'll have to check some other ones. So another one that, uh, another property of the subspace test that we're going to check is if Q is closed under scalar multiplication. So this means if I take a vector that's in Q and I multiply it by some scalar, is that resulting vector also going to be in Q? That's what that means. And we have to show that. So let's let V uh, be in Q. And we'll say V is equal to X1, Y1. And since V is in Q, we know that x1 is equal to y1 squared. I'll just put that on the side. And we know that's true because we said that v is in q. So let's take a look now. If we were to multiply c times v, where uh, c is some real number, just write that off to the side, then we would get c times x1 and c times y1, right? Makes sense so far. So let's, let's try taking a look at, remember we can't just start with our assumption. So let's just take a look at what, uh, why, why the second component squared is, right? So let's do CY1 squared. This is gonna be equal to C squared Y1 squared. So then, and remember we said earlier y1 squared is going to be equal to x1. So we can make a substitution for that y1 squared for x1. And from this, guys, you can see, if you don't already see it, uh, cy1 squared does not equal c times x1 because it equals c squared times x1. So we can then say that Therefore, Q is not, or Q is not a subspace of R2. Sorry. Right? And that's because it, it is not closed under scalar multiplication. Let's take a look at another example. This one, we're given t and t is the set of the vector xy which is also an r2 except we have the condition that xy must be equal to or greater than zero so again i always like to start with checking if the zero vector is in our set so let's do consider zero zero well let's do x times y right xy is equal to 
0 times 0, which equals 0. And 0 is equal to or greater than 0. So we know that the 0 vector is in t. OK. Let's check, the, let's check our uh, closed under scalar multiplication condition again. Let's do that off to the side here. So let's suppose, or let's define another vector, v, which is in t. And I'm going to define it as the same thing. Let's do uh, x1 and y1. Right? OK. So I already know that x1, y1 is greater to or equal than 0 because I said that v is in t. That's how I defined it. So let's do the same thing. Let's multiply some scalar v or some scalar c times v. C is a real number. So this would be equal to c x1 times c y1. So again, let's let's check what is equal to what is the first component times the second component, right? We need to show that that is equal to or greater than zero. So c x1 times c y1. This will be equal to c squared times x1 y1. So you'll notice we already said remember x1 y1 is equal to or greater than 0 because that's how we defined our vector v. We already said that it was in t so it has to be greater to or equal than 0 and we know that c is just some real number so if we take c squared there's no way that you're going to get a negative number, right? So you're always going to have some positive number times a positive number. Uh, and if c is 0, then you'll just get 0, right? It's equal Because it can be equal to 0, that's OK. So we know that since c squared is greater than or equal to 0, and x1, y1 is also either 0 or greater than 0, we can say that c squared x1, y1 is, is greater to or equal than 0. And remember, that's just, that's just the multiplication of our, two, our, of our two components. So therefore, c times v is in t. So we've satisfied two of them. Let's check to see if it's closed under scalar multiplication. So for easier examples like this, um, when we only have like a single condition that's like not too hard to, to check with some examples, um, like we're working in R2, it's just two components. I think it's easiest to use a counter example in this case. Um, it's because really what you're trying to do is, I guess, is, is break it, right? And if you're able to break it, then you can say that it's that T is not a subspace of R2 in this case. So let's think of some vectors that might be able to break this, right? So remember, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm checking that I'm closed under um, vector addition, I need that means that if I take a vector that is in t, and I take another vector that's in t, and I add them together, that must produce another vector which is in t. That's what it means to be closed under vector addition in this case. So I need to think of two vectors that are in t that I could break this with. So. Let's think here. So as it, since x, y has to be equal to or greater than 0, I could pick any, if I, I could choose any one of my components to be 0, and then that would be in t, right? Because then it would just be equal to 0. And that satisfies, that satisfies our condition to be in t. So let's suppose that we have 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. These are both in t, right? If you multiply those components together, I'll get 0. So if I were to add these two vectors together, that gives me 1, negative 1, right? And 1 times negative 1 is equal to 
negative 1 clearly and negative 1 is less than it's less than 0 right it's clearly not equal to or greater than 0 so through a counter example we've shown that um, t is not closed under vector addition so therefore t is not a subspace of R2 Let's take a look at another example. What happened? Oh, just give me one sec. So I have V, the set V, which is a vector in uh, R3, except v, uh, we're saying the first component has to be zero or the second component has to be equal to zero. So similar to the last one, let's just think right away. Let's try doing a counter example to quickly disprove this. So I know that I can come up with a vector with my first term that's equal to 0, and that will be in V. So let's do 0, uh, 1, 1. And then let's choose my, my Y component to be equal to 0. So we'll do 1, 1, 0, 0. Right? These are both in V. So let's quickly, let's add these two together. And this is equal to 1, 1, 1. And 1, 1, 1 is clearly not within V because nor the first or second component are equal to 0. So right away we can say V is not a subspace of R3. Great. So the last example that I'd like to do is one of the theorems, I want to prove it using the subspace test. And we have S is equal to the set of vectors V1 through VK. Uh, and we know that uh, these are vectors in Rn. And we're saying that the span of S is a subspace of Rn. Right? This is, uh, this is straight out of the lecture. So let's prove this using the subspace test, right? We can we can pretty easily do this. And quickly, I just want to add the condition that k must be equal to or less than or equal to n. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we know that so let let x be an element of the span of s. So any vector that's in the span of s is going to take the form of c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus all the way up to ck vk where c1 all these constants are real numbers right this is a this is a linear combination of all these vectors because x is x is in the span of s and that's what that's what the span is it's a linear combination so what can we do here first let's take a look at um, if the zero vector is within our span of s so let's suppose c1 c2 all the way up to ck are equal to zero. Well, then we'd get the first one would be zero times v1, which is zero, plus zero times v2, zero, plus, right? We just get a bunch of a bunch of zeros, or specifically a bunch of uh, zero vectors. So it, this would be equal to the zero vector, right? So zero is an element of the span of s. Okay, great, great. Let's take a look now at if this is closed under scalar multiplication. So let's define another another constant that I want to introduce. Let a be some real number. And let's take a look at a times x. Because a reminder, x is a uh, we already define x to be within the span. So let's check if we multiply a scalar times something that a vector that's in the span, 
I need to show that that is also going to be in the span. So I'll get a times c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus dot 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 ck vk. So expanding this out, get this. And you might already see this here, guys. This all these a times c1, a times c2, a to times ck, those are all just constants as well, right? So this is also a form of um, linear a linear combination of the vectors v, right? So this is clearly a, a times x is also within the span of s. Okay. So let's do let's do the last last condition now. So the, remember the last condition is if I take a vector or two vectors which are in the span of S, I add them together. This also needs to be within the span of S. And I only have one vector that I defined right now to be in the span of S, which is x. So let's introduce another one. Let's choose a uh, let's choose y. Let y be in the span of S. And let's define y to be equal to d1 times v1 plus d2 v2 all the way up to dk vk, where d1, d2, dk, these are all constants. Right? Make sure you're always defining what your variables are for full marks. Great. So remember, we're just trying to show x plus y needs to also be within the span. So let's just add them together, right? So my x is going to be my c constant, right? And then my y is just the, the same linear combination, but different constants. Okay, this is what I have. And you'll see since this is just addition of a bunch of different terms, I don't really need these brackets there. I just wrote that for, uh, for like ease of seeing it. So we can factor out, see we've got a, this. these are the only two terms with V1 in them. So I can factor out the V1 and I will be left with a constant in front, C1 plus D1 times V1. And you can do the same thing with all of these vectors, right? So I'd get C2 plus D2 times V2, right? And all the way up to CK plus VK, or sorry, DK times VK. And clearly, this is also, since C and D are just constants, this is also just some linear combination of my vectors v1 through vk. So x plus y, since those were vectors that were in the span of s, this is also within the span of s. And those are the three conditions of my subspace test, right? So we've, we've proven it. Therefore, the span of s is a subspace of and remember what, what the question was we're showing that it's a subspace of rn right because v1 all of these vectors whatever this set of vectors is whatever uh like dimension those vectors are in we're showing that the span of the set of those vectors has to be a subspace of the respective vector space that your vectors are in that's what the theorem is saying so a subspace of rn and you might be thinking, hmm, does that mean that every subspace in Rn has to be the span of a finite set of vectors? And that would actually be true. Every single subspace in Rn is going to be the span of some finite set of vectors. So I hope this video has helped, and I will catch you guys in the next one. See ya.